There we go. Uh, we're welcoming tonight Dr. Chris Wells, and, and Dr. Wells has a private counseling and consulting practice in Highlands Ranch, Colorado, and she works with gifted and twice exceptional adults. She's a writer, co-host of the Positive Disintegration podcast, president of the Dabrowski Center, and an advocate for the gifted. So welcome, Chris. Tonight, she's going to be presenting Overexcitability and Neurodivergence, an update. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Mark. I'm so grateful to be here on this lovely afternoon. And happy birthday again to you, Mark. I'm so grateful for you coming and doing this on your birthday with me. So this is my first time presenting on this particular topic. And overexcitability and neurodivergence is a different take than what you're probably used to. And I wanna to say too, before I kind of launch into this, that I'm not gonna be talking about overexcitability from the beginner's um, point of view. And so I'm hoping that everybody kind of has an idea of what it is already. But in this session today, we're gonna to talk about where the overexcitabilities came from, what the connection is with different types of neurodivergence, just briefly. And also we'll touch on the controversy around overexcitability and gifted education. So as Mark said, I am um, I'm a counselor, a consultant, um, and I'm a researcher. And so everything I'm talking with you about today is based on the research I've done over the past several years to understand Dabrowski's theory, to understand overexcitability. And what's interesting about me, I think, is that when I first discovered overexcitability, I was getting my PhD in psychology and I was coming at giftedness and disability from um, the perspective of being a doctoral student and trying to figure out my own path. I was working on my dissertation, which was a study about parenting stress and parents of twice exceptional kids. And I had been identified as gifted as a kid, and but then I had all of these mental health diagnoses that I got later. And so I discovered overexcitability while I was doing searches for giftedness and emotional intensity, um, giftedness and ADHD, uh, giftedness and mental illness, and just trying to figure things out. And so at that point in my studies, I had kind of planned on going into disability studies with my PhD. That's where my heart was. Um, I saw myself as gifted and mentally ill. And that was 2014. It was almost exactly eight years ago. And I remember, you know, vividly discovering the construct of overexcitability in a chapter by Michael Pihovsky and, um, and not loving it at first. I came to it and was like, wow, this is an interesting way to look at ADHD and autism and all of these other <laughs> um, diagnoses from the DSM. And so most people come to overexcitability and they recognize themselves in it and they love it. And that's not how it was for me. It was kind of the other way around. And so I just like to start with that because um, I think it's important to know that I came to this from a different perspective than usual. Um, Another thing I want to talk about just briefly before, you know, discussing where overexcitability came from is that one thing I've really noticed in the field of gifted education is that there's a lot of ableism in this field. Um, and that is another reason why I chose this topic for today is that I want you to watch this presentation and think about children being denied services, such as a 504 um, or an IEP in their education because they are gifted and having it perceived as overexcitability instead of um, a diagnosis such as ADHD or autism. 
because it's a real problem in this field that we are not um, that we're not seeing beyond the gift of label and that we're kind of stuck in uh, the prejudice of ableism. And so with all that being said, let's go into what, well, the theory of positive disintegration, that's where overexcitability comes from. And this theory was created by Kazimierz Dombrowski, who was from the Lublin, Poland area. He lived from 1902 to 1980. And he was a psychiatrist and a psychologist. And his theory, um, when I, like I said, when I discovered the theory, I was, you know, kind of trying to figure out my experience of being gifted and mentally ill. And I have found his theory to be liberating and empowering. It's a theory of personality in human development. And, you know, he lived through both world wars and he was really trying to understand like the breadth of humanity with his theory and kind of making sense of, um, you know, the whole range of people and what they're like. And um, the overexcitabilities are a critical part of the theory, but they also predated it. And so I created this brief timeline to kind of go through it, but it's important to understand that overexcitability has a very long history and it comes from the construct of nervousness. And so, or nervousness, I wouldn't say is a construct actually, but it's nervousness was like this, um, you know, I'm trying to think of like an easy way to describe it, but kind of the nervous temperament in a, in a person would mean that they are kind of anxious and overexcitable. Um, anyway, the theory <laughs> comes from um, Dabrowski's work on understanding suffering from different angles. Um, his, like I said, he was a psychiatrist and a psychologist. And so he did two theses. One was um, for his medical degree and it was on the psychological conditions of suicide. And on this slide, you can see that there were two types of overexcitability identified in that work and it's in French. Um, and then he did another thesis called The Psychological Basis of Self-Mutilation. And it, um, you know, is a whole range of ways of self-torment. Um, and there were, um, there were four types in that monograph, which is not actually what I'm talking about here. So that was, um, the Polish version came out in 1934. The English version was in 1937. But my work that, the work that I've done that really has informed my view on what he was talking about in the 1930s came from this book, um, Nervousness of Children and Youth. And so, you know, Dabrowski was a psychiatrist and he really, his early work um, was around child psychiatry. He came to the United States in the 30s and, um, and worked with children in Massachusetts. And so in this book, which is in Polish, he talks about a range of issues. Um, there, he talks about the four types of overexcitability I have listed on this slide. And, but also, I mean, he talks about impaired perceptions and illusions, problems with attention and memory, um, issues with imagination and fantasy. He talks about giftedness and mental work. He talks about anger, lying, laziness, disobedience, truancy, um, self-torment and self-mutilation, suicide, sexual issues, disorders of speech and writing, uh, a huge range of issues that children go through. It's basically a textbook of child psychiatry. And so in this textbook, he's talking about nervousness and he's using the term overexcitability. But interestingly, in the introduction, he states really clearly that the sample for the book was um, children with normal mental level, right? So not gifted children, although there were clearly some gifted children that he worked with because 
as I said, there is a, a brief section on that. But so this was like a foundation. And this, I mean, this book in the final chapter, he puts forth like the early origins of his theory for the first time. And he calls it eclectic theory, an eclectic theory of nervousness. And so in that chapter, he's got like Freud and Jung and, you know, other theorists of the time, Steckel um, and others. And then he puts forth his own views for the first time. And instead of calling it positive disintegration, he even talks about it as like a disaggregation. So it's a fascinating work. And Mike, we can thank Michael Pihovsky for, um, for translating hundreds of pages of it thus far. It's not finished yet, but it's been absolutely incredible to read Michael's translation of this book, to talk with him about the translation process. And we have both been just blown away by getting this glimpse into what Dabrowski was talking about with overexcitability. And so the first edition of the book was in 1935. It wasn't until 1958 when the second edition came out that he included intellectual overexcitability. And he considered that the rarest type and also the one that needed the least treatment because in other works, um, he does talk about treating overexcitability actually, um, even with medication in psychomotor. So there's a lot more overexcitability than anyone's been exposed to in the field of gifted education. It was in 1979 that overexcitability was introduced to gifted ed by Michael in a chapter called Developmental Potential. And so this is a chapter that many people are familiar with in the field. Um, and it's based on Michael's overexcitability questionnaire, the original one that had 46 items. And he collected data in 1973 from gifted students. Um, he was a graduate student at the time getting his second PhD. And he was at the University of Madison, I'm sorry, the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And he worked in the guidance laboratory for superior students. And so he, I think there were 31, yeah, there were 31 cases and he had the kids fill out this 46 item questionnaire. That's been another part of my work. Um, I have kind of reanalyzed that data and done a secondary analysis of it with um, a research assistant mm -hmm. last year. And it's been really interesting to re-examine all of that data from this modern modern perspective that I have and the assistant um, that I employed to work on it with me. But that's, you know, for another time, that's, I'm sure that we'll do a paper on that eventually, but we have not gotten to it yet. So this is just a, I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of how old overexcitability is as a construct. Um, like I said, it, it was around before Dabrowski. It was in, you can find it in William James's Principles of Psychology from 1890. Um, thanks to Bill Tillier who has provided so many resources uh, from the past. Thomas Clouston is another one from 1899. You're gonna see, oh, so on this next slide, I have a few QR codes in this presentation. And so if you scan these QR codes, um, it'll open up PDFs that I, that I created that will um, you know, just give you some documents that will help kind of back up what I'm saying here. And so if you click on this QR code, you'll find um, work that I've done, a chapter that I wrote with Michael on re-examining overexcitability, a paper called The Origins and Conceptual Evolution of Overexcitability with Frank Falk. And it's just, um, it gives you much more depth and you know information about what I'm saying here. But so there's five types of overexcitability if you do happen to be a newcomer to this construct. Um, these are the five types. This is a kind of a brief presentation. And so there's not even really a chance to go over them too much. Um, but you know, the psychomotor is uh, in a surplus of energy or it is 
kind of the expression of emotional tension uh, through a psychomotor outlet. So like nervous habits. Well, you know, in 2022, stimming is something that would fall under psychomotor overexcitability. Um, and also tick. So, you know, there's, there's kind of aspects of psychomotor overexcitability that we don't talk about much. And then the sensual overexcitability, um, you know, it's a heightened experience of sensual pleasure. But, you know, if we think about sensual overexcitability from the standpoint of like being a sensation seeker or being sensory defensive, you know, that's just kind of a, a different way of looking at it. Um, and I guess I just want to add the caveat that this, like these modern interpretations, this is something that we have to do research about. Um, there's not one paper that brings together overexcitability and twice exceptionality at this point that I can think of. And so there's a lot to be done in this area. Um, so intellectual overexcitability is the one that correlates most strongly with giftedness. Um, imaginational is, you know, like free play of the imagination, the capacity to live in a world of fantasy. Well, you know, autistic people often have the experience of paracosms and world play. And of course, not only autistic people. And so, you know, there are, I'm just trying to give like the flavor of the overlaps that we see between overexcitability and these like modern conditions from the DSM. I guess one thing that, you know, I, I wanted to mention too, is that when you think about Michael um, introducing overexcitability to Gifted Ed in 1979, well, DSM-3 came out in 1980. And that's where you saw uh, attention deficit disorder for the first time. It wasn't called attention deficit hyperactivity disorder until 1987 in DSM-3R. And so overexcitability being introduced to Gifted Ed actually came before some of these diagnoses that we have now um, were even around. And so, I mean, they, they were around, of course, you know, there's a whole history of autism and ADHD, but, um, you know, just like that, the technical ADHD wasn't around until later. So I have this slide to just kind of talk briefly about some of these connections with neurodivergence. So, Giftedness and overexcitability, obviously we've heard about that. There's more than 40 years of research. Well, there's, well, like I said, I mean, so if Michael first collected that data in 1973, I mean, even though he didn't publish it until later, I mean, there's really almost 50 years of research that exists that, you know, was done before it was published on, on gifted adolescents. But, you know, on this slide, so giftedness is there, ADHD, autism, anxiety and OCD. I mean, some people say that OCD is a kind of neurodivergence. I'm not sure that that's 100% accurate. I mean, there's there are different perspectives on these things, but I put anxiety and OCD here because these are also so prevalent among people who've been identified as gifted or diagnosed with ADHD or autism. Um, PDA stands for um, pathological demand avoidance, or which is also called um, a pervasive drive for autonomy and is considered a kind of neurodivergence. And um, PDA is interesting in that when I'm reading Dabrowski's work from 1935, it seems very clearly to me that he's often talking about children who are demand avoidant, that refuse to go to school, that are perceived as lazy or disobedient. And so, you know, there's a tremendous amount of overlap between what he was talking about and what we're talking about now. And kind of the problem is that no one has put them together yet. So this is my first time talking about overexcitability from this perspective. And I'll be really interested in feedback from viewers. If you know, I have my contact info at the end, I mean, please do feel free to reach out to me and ask questions about this stuff. Because, um, you know, as we're going through these old documents from Dabrowski, the book from 1935, Michael did translate and publish um, 
the translated paper on overexcitability Dabrowski did in 1938. And so, you know, as we're kind of becoming familiar with these things from the past and trying to bring them together with our present, it's, it's really way beyond what I can do on my own. Um, you know, if you're a graduate student watching this and, you know, this is something that you'd be interested in doing your dissertation on, please feel free to reach out because there's, um, there's so much here to work with. I mean, just the book from 1935 that we're going through, I mean, there are still a couple of chapters that Michael has to do. Um, and it's, it's just an enormous amount of text to process and kind of contextualize from a modern standpoint. So um, let's see, also on this slide, so depression and bipolar, other you know, areas that kind of connect with, with overexcitability, you know, extremes of mood, uh, you know, at both ends. And so, you know, bipolar disorder, that was the diagnosis that I, I was given when I was young. Um, when I came to overexcitability, I had been taking medication for bipolar disorder for like 20 years. And so I personally was misdiagnosed with bipolar disorder. I see myself as an ADHD -er now, um, but there are lots of people who do have bipolar disorder um, and resonate with overexcitability. And so I guess um, another thing that I wanted to talk about in this session today is just that diagnoses are not carved in stone. You know, now that I work um, from, now that I work with clients, I don't diagnose, I don't work from the medical model. I work from Dabrowski's theory as my model. And the next slide actually is about the developmental implications of the theory. This theory gives us an alternative to the medical model. I mean, Dabrowski's whole point with positive disintegration and overexcitability was that this was something that was a positive thing in development, that um, if you had overexcitability, it didn't mean that there was something wrong with you or that you were broken. And so him saying that in the 1930s, um, in you know, making that such an important part of his theory, you know, as a part of the developmental potential um, is a huge deal. You know, unlike his contemporaries, he was able to identify these aspects of people as um, something positive and something that was perceived though as negative. And so um, when I say that this is a non-pathologizing framework for understanding intense experience, I mean, what I mean is that Giftedness is an intense experience. ADHD, autism, these are types of intense experience. Bipolar disorder, you know, any of these modern conditions or giftedness, these are all, um, well, these are ways of experiencing the world that are really diverge from the norm. And they are seen as you know, generally something wrong with you. That's why they're in the DSM, which is a manual for mental disorders. Dabrowski's theory is liberating and empowering because it comes from a different perspective. You know, for him, if you went through the process of positive disintegration, which is difficult and can be very painful and lengthy and, you know, very intense, you, it was something to, I mean, it wasn't a problem. It wasn't that you were mentally ill. In fact, he saw that as signs of mental health. And he saw people who were adjusted to everyday reality as the ones who really had the problem. I mean, there's so much more to the theory than we can possibly get into. I mean, I'm looking at the time and I see that it's already like 26 minutes after the hour. And so I'm just trying to give you like a sense of what he was talking about. Within his theory, overexcitabilities were kind of elements of disintegration. They created challenges. And we see that, right? I mean, if you are an ADHD or, or if you're autistic, you are different. You're 
your experience of reality is different than people who are in the neuro majority. And so there are so many developmental implications of this particular theory. Um, it's not about, you know, and, you know, for Dabrowski, like in overexcitability, it's not about fixing somebody. Um, it's about growth and development. I mean, the overexcitabilities are the raw material for dynamisms. And the dynamisms in this theory are the shapers of personality. And they are what make up the process of development. And so it's a very different framework than the medical model in which you're looking at everything as a deficit. Like these are symptoms of mental illness or they're symptoms of a developmental disorder. I mean, for Dabrowski, these were really, I mean, he called them a tragic gift, but you know, they are like the raw material for development. So, and he also took a mental hygiene approach, like an interdisciplinary approach. And so he, he was more about like optimizing, you know, a person's potential, providing them the right environment, supporting them, making sure that they had like mentors or guides um, compared to treating them and seeing them as like a, a patient that in the way of like an object, you know, from our medical model, we see a client or a patient in front of us, you know, and label them with a diagnosis. He worked with his clients to come up with a diagnosis with the patient, which is such a different way of operating than we do now. So the last major thing to go over uh, before trying to kind of tie things together is the controversy in gifted ed. This is something that I had to address. And so what I have on this slide are the titles of three papers that um, they all kind of address the conflict around overexcitability. There were a couple of papers that came out in 2016 that basically said that overexcitability and openness to experience were the same thing and that we should stop talking about overexcitability because it's really openness to experience. And um, from that, there, were, there was also kind of a push or, you know, there was, well, I don't know how to describe it. I mean, there are like a handful of academics in gifted ed who've been very vocal that the theory is pseudoscience. But in fact, there's a long scientific um, history, a long history of scientific inquiry, I should say, around this theory. Um, so much so. I mean, in the 1935 book on nervousness, I mean, Dabrowski talks about his methods. That's the first place. I mean, and then there's decades of his own work before it was introduced to gifted ed. And then, of course, there's decades of research in this field as well. And so um, I did a presentation at NAGC in November, like directly dealing with this issue of pseudoscience. And so um, it's not pseudoscience, it's a scientific theory. Um, if you want to see my slideshow from NAGC, feel free to reach out. Um, you know, the, the papers that I've shared with these QR codes all provide plenty of evidence to the contrary. They show that um, in the paper by Sheila Gallagher, she does a really brilliant job of showing that overexcitability and openness to experience work well as complementary constructs and that we can better understand gifted students by looking at them through the lenses of openness to experience and overexcitability rather than one or the other. And that's really, um, I guess, the thing that I would say to keep in mind is that this stuff isn't black and it's not black and white, you know, it's not either or. It's not Dabrowski's theory or the five factor model. Like we can better understand this population by looking at both of these, you know, the theory and the five factor model. So 
that's really all the time that I want to give to this con controversy, to be honest, except to say that, you know, I highly recommend that you scan the QR code, get these papers. If you are unfamiliar with using QR codes, please reach out to me. I don't mind at all sharing this stuff. Um, so I guess what I want to kind of leave you with is that there was a long, long period of like maybe 20 years in the field of gifted ed where there was a lot of enthusiasm about overexcitability kind of beginning in the 1980s and going into the 2000s where it was seen as a characteristic of giftedness, but all of, I mean, all of that early work around Dabrowski was unknown. It's not like Michael just ignored it. He didn't have access to this 1935 book until 2019 when I finally got a copy of it myself and shared it with him. So this is relatively new information, even though it's old. And so what we know now, well, they didn't know in the 80s, you know, until now, like people really believed that overexcitability was a characteristic of giftedness, that it could be used to distinguish the gifted from, from the non-gifted. And so there were many years and many studies done to try and kind of tie overexcitability to giftedness, but it can't be used to identify giftedness. And it's not only for the gifted. But that being said, we know that overexcitability is a relatively common experience in the gifted, that there's a strong relationship between intellectual overexcitability and intelligence or giftedness. And so there's, I mean, personally, I have almost as many questions as I have answers about this stuff, to be honest. There's, there's still so much to learn and so much to figure out. And the fact that oversight ability is not only for the gifted is exciting to me personally. I love the idea of bringing this construct to people outside of the field and helping them see themselves in Dabrowski's words and to be able to find positive disintegration liberating. Um, on my, so here's my contact slide. You'll see, you know, I have my email address here. My link tree has um, the podcast that I do, and there's a QR code for that too. But so I have a podcast now called Positive Disintegration uh, with a co-host, Emma Nicholson. And we are talking about this stuff there. We're talking about the theory in more depth than I'm able to in this presentation. And there's so much to say about all of this. There's huge overlap between overexcitability and other areas of neurodivergence beyond the gifted. And so I hope that, I mean, I hope that we'll learn much more about this in the coming years and that we will keep translating from the Polish and that we'll keep doing new research and creating new instruments and ways to explore this stuff. It's really incredible. It's changed my life. Um, I think that the most compelling thing I can say is that you know, like I said at the beginning of this session, I saw myself as gifted and mentally ill when I first came to all of this. I was taking medication. I just assumed that I would be on medication for the rest of my life. I saw myself as broken. And now, eight years after discovering the theory, I don't take medication anymore. It's been more than five years. I, um, it's changed my whole life. I realized that I had a lot of internalized ableism. I had a lot of misconceptions about myself. I just, growing up knowing that I was gifted and not um, knowing that I was an adhd -er, that I had these other differences was really devastating for me. And I know now that I work with adults in the field that there are a lot of gifted people who have been totally failed by the field of gifted education and just never were told what it means to be gifted, never given any kind of insights other than it was their score on some test or what they did in the classroom. 
it's really, really important that we take the time to better understand um, and help the gifted understand what it means to be gifted beyond the achievement aspect of it. Could do another whole presentation just about that. And so I am going to wrap up. Oh, one more thing. Yes, these final slides remind me. So I just created um, with help a new nonprofit called the Dabrowski Center. And the Dabrowski Center is going to be the international home of the theory. And we don't know for sure that this is gonna be the logo that we stick with because it's so new that the government hasn't even approved the 501c3 application yet, but you know, fingers crossed. This is going to be a place where we're gonna make available a public archive of uh, works related to the theory. We're gonna, build community around the theory um, and around overexcitability and giftedness and just give people a place to come for answers um, and to learn more about themselves and to see themselves through this Dabrowskian lens, which has been such a blessing for so many people. And so uh, with that, I think I am going to end my slideshow and take your questions and stop sharing my screen. Right. Thank you, Chris. We do have some questions and um, we'll just piggyback off one of the things you said at the end that so often gifted individuals are not taught about what giftedness means beyond some test scores. And I find that to be true too with adults. Um, as I'm working with their children, they'll say things like, oh, I used to be gifted and I used to be in some of those classes and they don't really have an understanding about what that means for them necessarily. And they begin to understand that as we work with their children. So that being said, and, and if, if overexcitabilities are maybe a good avenue to start learning about giftedness, do you have a particular resources that you find appealing for if, if I'm going to dive into overexcitabilities as an adult, do you have any recommendations for places to look first? Well, you know, with my clients, when it comes to that question, I usually have them start with living with intensity just because it's, um, you know, so living with intensity, the book by Susan Daniels and Michael Behofsky is a good entrance like yep. into the land of Dabrowski and overexcitability and as it relates to the gifted. But um, beyond that, you know, I have a paper that I wrote when I came to all of this kind of, so if I have clients who are like twice exceptional, that's where I point them to my paper on the inner experience of giftedness because I talked in that paper about my own discovery that there was an inner experience of giftedness, that it mattered past age 18, that it was a real legitimate difference in my life. And so um, I've, a lot of people have just said that that paper helps them. Um, and also the podcast now is a place that I can point to people, you know, point people to when it comes to learning about or excitability. Um, but we need more places. And then when it comes to like community on the inner gift, on the internet, you know, I recommend adults check out Intergifted as a place where they can find other adults um, who are like them. I would love to read that paper that you wrote um, because I think that probably re would reflect my own experience as well. And I had been teaching gifted kids for maybe 18 years before I read Living with Intensity and it completely changed, not completely, it changed and refocused the way I thought about giftedness. And it was a gift in itself. I would, I would love to read your paper. Um, though I should stop talking because we're getting some questions here in the chat. And here's one from one of those gifted adults, I bet. Uh, it says, uh, Krista is asking, I guess regardless of whether you look at this kind of neurodivergence as OEs and a positive thing for personal development, or as a pathology, as a DSM disorder. My issue is that they make it hard to function. OEs make it hard to function in a world designed for neurotypical people. And I just wanna function consistently in that world. How is the OE approach useful for that? 
That's a great question. Well, and it's not just it's not just one way or the other. Like, I mean, there are lots of adults that I know, and I used to be one of them. Like, just because I'm not taking medication now, it's it's honestly like part of why I don't take medication is because I find it such a hassle to have to go to the doctor and get prescriptions and take it. And that I've kind of learned to like hack my life in a way that I can not, you know, need it. But I think that, you know, if you have a diagnosis like ADHD or autism or both of them, that you can certainly still rely on medication if you need it. And, you know, other you know, like other ways of dealing with it from that perspective, but also having the overexcitability perspective helps because in Dabrowski's theory, he gives us this, it's a huge, like deep theory. And so he gives us all of these ways of understanding our personal growth through dynamisms, um, you know, through inner transformation. And that's the thing that has kind of gotten lost in the gifted field by talking so much about overexcitability as a characteristic of giftedness, there wasn't enough about, um, you know, dynamisms as drivers of growth, of inner transformation. And so for Dabrowski, he would have pointed you to things like meditation or using auto psychotherapy and kind of figuring out how to deal with your own personal blend of overexcitability. And I would say that that's what I've had to do too. It blows my mind to realize that until I was in my 40s, it never occurred to me that I needed like noise canceling headphones or a weighted blanket or to use earplugs at night because I needed to be completely quiet when I sleep. It's okay to honor these things about yourself and to really take care of yourself. And I would say the same thing about, you know, people with strong over um, emotional overexcitability it's really important for you to make sure that you have good boundaries with other people and you're not just like absorbing their emotional energy or giving too much of yourself. Like there's so many little things that you have to do if you have overexcitability in order to deal with them. And so I think it has to be kind of a blend of whatever works for you. And I would never, I just want to be really clear that I would never point someone away from medication or a psychiatrist or whatever they need in order to function because i mean you have to do what you have to do thank you uh do the qr codes have articles about the overlap of adhd and oe yeah the one on the slide um where i said like for more about overexcitability my chapter with michael and the paper with frank both go into that a bit and give some examples from like the origins paper I did with Frank Falk has examples of like what Dabrowski said about psychomotor overexcitability compared to uh, the hyperactivity impulsivity dimension of ADHD in the DSM, for instance. And so there's much more there than I possibly could have talked about like just in this brief session. And um, someone is asking too, could you remind us what the name of your podcast is? Yes, it's called Positive Disintegration, and it's on Substack, like that's where we host it, but you can also find it on Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts and Spotify and the rest of those platforms. Um, and just uh, maybe a, trying to make these more questions than comments, we have a lot of wonderful comments, by the way, in the chat, and I think you'll be able to see them uh, when, you, when, you, uh, when you're able to look at the video later. Uh, but a lot of a lot of people saying thank you and a lot of people relating their personal journeys to what you've been saying and and that's very valuable so that's wonderful to see i'm doing the same thing myself. Um, I love how you say uh, how you call it let's look at it as a shaper of personality and instead of a disability let's look at it as a framework for understanding intense experience, and I think that is really one of the true values for a teacher of, of gifted kids to be able to frame some of the behaviors a little bit differently than I might have framed them before and and one for parents as well so I, I just want to thank you for all of that and um, with all the comments I'm seeing also I want to I would I want to thank you because people have really related to this 
and um, everybody remember that you can catch the, the recordings uh, again on coloradogifted.org, look under resources. But at, at the end here, Chris, I just allow you a little bit of time to, if you want to kind of, kind of close it off for us. Sure. Well, and one thing I really wanted to say that I kind of forgot about until now, and it's really, and I, so when I say this, I want to make clear that, I mean, this really comes from a place of love, right? Like I have been lucky to work with Michael Bihovsky and I, you know, worked for a while with Linda Silverman and I've gotten to know these people and they're such an important part of my life. But, you know, interestingly, like with Michael, it's, I see how hard it is for, um, like, for people in this field to acknowledge disability or to acknowledge these disorders. Like for me with Michael, I've heard from him, like he will never admit that I am an adhd -er. I'm sure that until the day he dies, he will tell me that I'm wrong and I don't have ADHD and it's really overexcitability. And I just, one of the big problems in this field is this, um, this inability to accept that, like there's nothing wrong. It's okay that I'm an ADHD -er. It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with me. I'm not broken. I don't, um, I don't function in the world like a, typical person and that is okay and it doesn't matter how gifted I am I can still be an ADHD or two and that's the thing like in this field it's very hard for people to say oh but you're well they say well you're gifted you know it's it's you don't have ADHD well you can have both like this is an area that we really really need to improve on in this field well, thank you so much. We're continuing to get some thoughts. And is there a way for people to reach out to you? What's the best way for people to reach out to you if they have further questions or, or just want to share some comments and thank yous? Sure. Yeah, they can write to me um, to my email address that I shared on that last slide, uh, chris at christianwells.com. I am always glad to hear from people. So please do reach out um, for sure. Wonderful, and thank you. Um, 